All right, is it now? Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to try to click it real quick just to make sure we can see all the different slides. Sure. Is that working? New slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your checking that out for me. All right. Um, all right, I guess I'll just go ahead and begin. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Crystal Charity. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Maryland. And today I'll be presenting what counts as ethnic studies, how teachers are building California's high school ethnic studies curriculum. So first let me share who I am and what experiences I bring to the study. I'm invested in making space for these critical analyses of racism in California schools because I personally spent 13 years experiencing Eurocentric, color evasive education as a student in California public schools. In response, I went on to teach ethnic studies in a public charter school in Oakland, California. Notably, I navigated the school system, not just as a student and a teacher, uh, but simultaneously as a multiracial black girl and woman. So I bring these identities to my work as well. And now that I'm a graduate student, I want to leverage my knowledge and resources to help build effective ethnic studies programs across my home state. To that end, my research question was, how do public high school teachers in California determine what to cover in introductory ethnic studies courses? So what is included, what is left out, and why? Um, in the growing body of research that already exists on K through 12 ethnic studies courses, I noticed that many studies explore the skills that students gain from ethnic studies coursework or highlight the efficacy of specific pedagogies or assignments within an ethnic studies course. But there's little focus on teachers holistic approach to teaching ethnic studies or their curriculum development process. So I aimed, I aimed to address this gap in my study. This work is urgently needed because in October of 2021, California's governor mandated ethnic studies as a high school graduation requirement. So what that means is that by 2025-26 school year, high schools across the state must offer at minimum a one semester ninth grade ethnic studies course. Um, and because of that, K through 12 ethnic studies researchers should support California schools in developing quality critical curriculum during this transition if we want ethnic studies to be done effectively. Right, turning to my conceptual framework, I actually combined two theories. So first, I looked at Bold and Gentis's social reproduction theory, which stated that schooling is a mechanism for reinforcing social and economic hierarchies. In short, it says that schools reward individual traits that are profitable to society's existing structures, such as like its institutions of labor, for example. While social reproduction theory offered a structural analysis of powers in schools, it evaded race in favor of class relations instead of examining both classism and racism in schools. Given that race is central to my work, I borrowed from critical race theory to build out social reproduction. Critical race theory or CRT is a legal theory developed by the likes of Derrick Bell in the 1970s. Uh, more recently, scholars like Dixon and Anderson have applied CRT to education. So CRT states that the US's current educational practices both construct and reconstruct racial equality, inequality, and it perpetuates a normative whiteness. Together, these theories help me make sense of how schools in the US traditionally function and why. Moving into my methods and participants, as you can see from the table, I ended up with four participants from a diverse range of backgrounds who taught at a mix of urban and suburban schools. I conducted one individual semi-structured interview with each of the teachers. I conducted the interviews over Zoom and each interview lasted 60 minutes. The teachers taught at four separate schools, three of which were in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and one of which was in the Southern California region. To recruit participants, I used snowball sampling because I had previously taught ethnic studies. I already knew some current ethnic studies educators. I connected with those whom I knew and I asked them to forward my recruitment email to anyone that they thought might be interested. Um, notably, this is a pilot study. Um, this pilot study was conducted as part of a graduate level research methods course, so I was working within a time, tight time constraint. Um, I'm actually looking to expand this study as part of my dissertation research as I move into um, my dissertation proposal process. For my findings today, I just highlighted three of the major themes that I found in my data. 
So the first one, um, it was that it was evident that participants considered a variety of stakeholders when determining what to cover in their ethnic studies courses. So first of all, they considered their students racial and economic and ethnic backgrounds, as well as their prior knowledge and abilities. So um, who their students were, who was present in their classroom became this focal point from which the rest of their uh, curriculum kind of emanated out. They then tried to predict parents' reaction to the curriculum, particularly white parents, and edit their curriculum accordingly. Uh, the thirds, they all worked to make their curriculum relevant to their local context, such as incorporating history that was unique to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, three teachers also highlighted how much knowledge and how many resources that they gained from other ethnic studies educators, although only one of them was able to collaborate with colleagues who worked at the same school site. And finally, the expectations and support or lack thereof from school and from district administrators determined how flexible the teachers could be with their curriculum. So Luis gives an example of this, right? He's explaining his textbook choice and he states it even includes a chapter on Irish people so white folks don't trip. Three of the four teachers spent a lot of time considering the feelings of white students and the potential for pushback from white families um, because, of course, a lot of the content is going to be focused around uh, historical and present racism in the U.S., which can be obviously uh, a controversial or uncomfortable experience for those who are white. Um, in Luis's case, in addition to understandable concerns for his students' emotional safety, this emphasis seemed to be born out of a desire to avoid backlash and retain the institutional legitimacy of his newly developed course. This is an unfortunate reality of ethnic studies teachers, um, especially in the current educational climate where there's a lot of pushback and fighting between more liberal and more conservative sides around things like critical race theory in K through 12. The second theme would be identity and inclusion. All of the teachers started class with a unit on identity and work culture. They described these units as a way to gain buy-in from students to build community and to affirm students' cultural and racial identities. The teachers also believed that it would increase understanding across racial and cultural differences. And this is not surprising to me because themes of belonging, of representation, of inclusion were central to how the teachers understood ethnic studies. For example, Bree shared that ethnic studies feels like being seen. Uh, the third and final theme that I'm going to highlight are the constraints that teachers faced. So time was a big one. For two teachers, they taught only semester length courses. So semesters are about three months long, um, three to four months. And the other two teachers taught US history and ethnic studies as one combined course. As a result, they all reported that there was not enough time to cover the material. They had to cut topics that they found important like environmental racism. There also wasn't enough time or collaboration, or excuse me, or opportunity for collaboration. According to three of the four teachers, they did not have time to work with other teachers to build better, stronger, more effective curriculum. Um, all of the teachers also said that they wished that there were high quality resources available for ethnic studies educators, such as curriculum maps, because currently a lot of that work was being done to create it from scratch at each individual school. Due to these constraints, three of the teachers explicitly stated that they did not think the state's public school system was currently prepared to support the development and implementation of ethnic studies curriculum and mass. They asked questions like, who all is gonna teach the course? And who is gonna teach educators how to teach the course? Additionally, three of the teachers had required courses already. They felt like this led to a lack of buy-in for some of the students. As Allison explained, some students have high buy-in and a strong background in our concepts, and some have to be shown the value of what we're doing. In Allison's case, she had previously taught ethnic studies as an elective and now teaches it as a requirement. And she found that students in the mandatory ethnic studies courses came in with vastly different levels of understanding and commitment from one another. As a result, Allison spent significant class time on activities designed to increase student buy-in and build community across those differences. While this is not inherently a problem, it is something that ethnic studies teachers in California should consider as their courses become requirements. So what does this mean? What it means is that ethnic studies teachers were trying their best to implement effective curriculum, at least those in my study, which is small for now, but there were a few areas in which they struggled. 
So one big one was resources and support. They need time for collaboration and lesson planning. They need professional development tailored to their content area. They need resources and books and administrative support and flexibility as they teach concepts that are controversial and challenging. On a broader structural level, uh, one participant, Bree in particular, highlighted how difficult, how draining it is to work within a system that you know to be deeply flawed and even oppressive. Because they're working within that existing system, teachers have to consider a variety of stakeholders as they design curriculum. It is important to incorporate your students' interests and perspectives, to include families' expertise, and to learn from colleagues. But as we saw with Luisa's quote earlier, ethnic studies is an inherently politicized space, and teachers are particularly cognizant of the ways that people with power, from the families of their white students to district level administration, ultimately determine what they can and cannot cover in ethnic studies curriculum. Every teacher that I interviewed described concessions that they'd made to meet traditional schooling standards or even ways they censored themselves to avoid backlash. This would be an example of interest convergence, uh, which is a theory as part of the critical race theory coined by Derek Bell to describe the phenomenon wherein those in power will only support the interests of the marginalized if their personal interests align with those. So lastly, despite all of these, teachers must maintain a structural analysis of racism. I caution against focusing too extensively on identity and culture because this individualizes concepts that are rooted in collective power and oppression. It is important for minoritized students to, be feel, to feel seen and validated definitely, um, but that cannot be the ultimate goal of an ethnic studies program. Students should also be empowered to affect structural changes and to understand their position within these systemic race-based hierarchies. Without this level of analysis, ethnic studies risks being used as yet another tool of multicultural education that reinforces the reproduction of racial hierarchies and inequalities in U.S. society, which ethnic studies itself is actually meant to reveal and dismantle. Finally, I will conclude with a few implications. First, it is imperative that researchers continue to study what is being taught in K through 12 ethnic studies classrooms as these courses become more common across the country, but especially as California schools prepare to meet the state's mandate by 2025. Second, I need to expand my own study. As I stated, it's a pilot study that I'm building on for my dissertation. And in doing so, I plan to recruit more participants for a much larger sample size, uh, going from four to probably 15 to 20 teachers. And I will also conduct classroom observations and analyze documents such as course syllabi to have more robust and accurate data set. For research to be useful to ethnic studies practitioners and not just researchers, especially with this influx of new practitioners, Studies should focus on the curriculum development process. My study specifically applies to practitioners because I explain how teachers are making choices about what content to cover and what barriers to implementation currently exist, which can serve as a roadmap for developing new ethnic studies programs. All right, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening.